This is Sarnia Lifton Daily for Monday, May 25th. Good evening, I'm Terry Doyle. On Sunday, the Premier of Ontario told people to go get tested for COVID-19, but health officials say not so fast. There is a process in place, and part of it is to avoid sick people infecting those who are healthy. Remember, it's not a walk-in model, and that's very intentional. We don't want people mixing, and what we don't want is large numbers of people congregating for a test because that would defeat the purpose of trying to stop the spread of the disease. So those two things are very important to remember. And in terms of the capacity and capability, I think we don't, we'll have to see how that goes based on what the demand looks like. You know, because of the things that we know about the test, uh, it's very, very important for us to make sure that everybody who needs the test for the purpose of a diagnosis because they have symptoms gets that. And then as a follow-up to make sure that, that we're able to provide testing to people who want to test even if they don't have symptoms. The death toll in Sarnia Lampton continues to rise due to COVID-19 with a pair of weekend deaths at a Sarnia long-term care facility. Six residents of Vision Nursing Home have now passed away during the pandemic, including two over the weekend. Overall, 22 residents have tested positive since the outbreak began in late April. There have also been 19 staff testing positive for the virus. The outbreak at Vision Nursing Home began on April 23rd. Overall, 248 people have tested positive for COVID-19 in Sarnia Lampton with 21 deaths and 177 people recovered. That leaves 50 active cases in the region. Let's go down to Sarnia City Hall and check in with Mayor Mike Bradley. And uh, Mike, another weekend is done. And uh, I guess thankful that we didn't see uh, what we saw in Toronto when it came to their park and the, uh, uh, the people just jammed in there. Did From what you saw, it seemed like most people here are sort of following the rules and, you know, certainly itch itching to get close to people, but at the same time knowing that, uh, you know, just be a little more patient. Well, Terry, it's, it's understandable. People, you know, we're getting into the warm weather. They've been confined for a couple of months. I'm not in any way uh, endorsing or justifying what happened in Toronto. We had a couple of incidents here, but nothing major. And that was good. I think uh, in a smaller community, you can get that message across. It was appalling what happened in Toronto. And now I see today, the mayor's actually apologizing. He went there on the Saturday, wasn't covered up, was very close to people. And I think that's a lesson for all of us. I'm personally paranoid about being out in the community and being close to people in the sense of someone takes a picture that makes things look like you're not social distancing or you're not doing what you should be doing uh, but uh, it's going to get worse you know uh, just this weekend in britain there was huge mass turnouts at the beaches uh, in the united states it's been an ongoing issue they open the beaches then they have to close them and we've had considerable discussion at the primary control group about the beach issue i mean grand bend is still closed we still have canaterra blocked off uh, and you can walk on the beaches as long as you're social distancing and you're not in not breaking the provincial rule of no more than five people. But it's going to be a real issue for us as uh, summer rolls around and we're trying to get our head around it. Uh, the information from elsewhere is not good because it's just very difficult to uh, keep people in compliance. Now we had some questions through our social media about the beaches indeed and I understand is the guideline pretty much obviously I know the parking lot's blocked so you've got to find your way there but after that let's say you've got a family of four. Keep to yourself walk the beach, stick your feet in the water, that's fine, just sort of keep to your own little small group? Well, the preference is of no gathering, that really you can walk the beach, but don't gather there. Uh, and that is, see, that's part of the, Terry, the complexity of all this. Different places are doing different things. Uh, we have discussed, along with the Village of Point Everett, who are on our primary control group call every day, at some point, removing the blockades. There's a reason it's not happening this week, is because Point Everett, uh, in their area, has some construction planned, so it's ideal to do it this week and then we'll take another look at uh, the blockades of those particular places. Uh, but it, uh, it, you know, we don't want to restrict people, but we were following the direction of what the province was suggesting. And uh, as it gets warmer, it gets tougher. And I think it's going to be a long, hot summer in many different ways. Has it been a challenge as well, sometimes having to interpret some of the provincial rules where what comes out is sort of very top level, but then applying it to what happens here locally? Well, it is. Uh, we feel like fortune tellers, you know, and it's, it's like the nine blind men uh, trying to tell you what an elephant looks like. There are nine different versions, and that's created a lot of issues. And I've tried to express that to, to Bob Bailey uh, the last time we spoke about we need more clarity when they announce something. I mean, the issue that really took us by surprise yesterday when the uh, premier had an impromptu press conference and then announced uh, without public health's knowledge, as far as I can tell from talking to them this morning, oh, everyone can be tested and they can do it right now. 
And um, so public health is scrambling today. We talked earlier this morning on our regular call, uh, trying to interpret what did he mean and how did he mean it. And uh, so far we've been advising people, you know, if you think you have the symptoms, talk to your doctor, get a referral, but it may be at some point if the decision is made just to open up the uh, testing center that anyone can go who has concerns and can be tested. That's what's happening in Windsor. But this one came out of the blue, and, and I think the Premier often, you know, he's getting a lot of credit for how he's handling uh, this particular crisis, but often some of the things he says come back to haunt us. A good example the other day was saying, well, any business can ban someone who isn't wearing a mask. Well, that's not true. You can't discriminate against people that way unless the province passes a law that says you must wear a mask. So it's, um, it seems to me that the Premier might be wiser to pull back and maybe be on air three days a week and be a little bit more scripted on the impacts. Every time they announce something, for example, when they announced that the arenas and, and baseball diamonds could be open again, well, that's fine, except because of the number of staff cuts we've made, over 160 seasonal and students, we're not in a position to open them even if we could open them. And we won't be till July at the earliest because that was our contribution to the COVID war. We took a very, very serious cut in our budget, almost a million point seven, to uh, let us be prepared when the economic fallout happens, which is going to happen, where we start to see businesses. Like even this past weekend, I was told of two or three uh, restaurants that have closed and probably are not going to reopen. So, you know, we're starting to feel that storm. So he's got to be really careful. And I'm, I'm sensitive to it. It's very easy. Uh, to say something and you know, not realize the consequences to people. We'll get back to the economic part in a moment, but I'm sure too it's a challenge because, for example, you mentioned the ball diamonds, but I know Baseball Ontario has suspended any operations now until June 15th, so uh, you know you could open a ball diamond, but officially baseball activities can't happen. I'm sure that's where, indeed, it's the province saying one thing, what you're dealing with locally, sometimes other organizations, how they're dealing with things, or if maybe a summer camp, for example, has already been canceled, I guess that's where it's one reaction or one announcement can be three or four different reactions depending on who else is involved in it. Exactly. And, um, you know, we have, at least July 3rd, said those programs can't take place. And the other, I mean, the, the real problem is this. The, the provincial guideline that says you can have mo more than five people. Well, that basically destroys organized sport. Uh, if we thought it was worthwhile, you can't do it anyhow. Um, I believe the pickleball courts and the tennis courts are open because of the individual nature of that sport. And they're being opened with some, some strict conditions on them. But until the, uh, the number of people that can gather has changed, none of these activities. So there was a good example. We have our emails and calls saying, oh, I expect the arena will be open this week or, or this will be open. And the answer is no, it won't. One, because we don't have the staff. And that's because of the massive cut we made to control our own spending. So we are in better shape later this year if we start to lose more and more businesses. And the estimate in the tourism sector is quite high, 20 to 30 percent. And that would be, on a community of this size, that would be really, really difficult to absorb. When it comes to the economic impact, I know earlier today you sent off a letter to the Prime Minister's office. Yes, I did. And uh, originally when we made our 1.7 in cuts, I was very clear in the media I did here and outside of the community, that, in my view, personally, was our contribution to the federal and provincial governments to assist, that we were taking some really tough actions to try to stabilize our own finances in the future, but also as our contribution. I now believe we're at the stage with the federal government, with all the other groups they're supporting. They need to help the bigger cities and the smaller communities across this country from coast to coast. And that's the essence of the letter, is the fact is in areas like transit and other revenue areas, we are in serious trouble. And to compound it is the federal government, provincial government has all sorts of revenue sources, you know, sales taxes and fees and all those things. We basically have one, and that is property taxes. And that is a very a regressive form of taxation. It's uh, not one that grows as the economy grows in great terms or quickly. So I think it's time the federal government looked at doing something to assist. And at the end of my letter, I make a couple of points to the prime minister, long, long time causes my own. Back in uh, 2007, uh, David Miller, the mayor of Toronto at the time, and myself with a number of other mayors called upon that federal government when they were going to lower the GSTs don't lower it, keep that one cent, and we call it the one cent campaign. If you were to give that to Canadian municipalities, uh, that uh, there would be four billion in those dollars out there for us across the country. We wouldn't be coming to your doorstep when we're in trouble like we are now, asking for assistance. And I think after this, they need to look at how the revenue is shared. The dollar each citizen pays in taxes in this country, less than 10 cents of that comes to the municipalities. 
The rest goes to the provinces and to the federal government. So that needs to be rejected. The other pet cause for many years is someone who's been very involved in advocating for people on social distance and particularly people with uh, uh, disabilities is a guaranteed income. In many ways, what's going on right now in this country uh, with the different programs they've set up, that's what they're doing. And it's been proven a guaranteed income can be done in a manner that uh, stabilizes people, puts them above the poverty line, and does not lead to people not seeking work if they want to better themselves. So I think that idea is receiving more support now. So out of the dust of what has been a terrible year so far for Canada, I think there's some real opportunity to look at how cities are funded and also to stabilize people's basic lives by a guaranteed income. And you know, it's interesting, uh, when I brought this to county council a couple of years ago, I had support from the conservative MP and I had support from the conservative MPP and I had it from other political parties because it eliminates the bureaucracy. It's a straight transfer of funds, and it makes it simple. And I hope that, uh, again, when this is over, we can take a really good look at uh, uh, of something of that nature being put in place in Canada. One way that's been even able to, or the city has been able to, uh, you know, go through these cuts and be able to keep things going is the agility of the workers. And I know, especially with the weather nice, we've got arena workers out there doing some of the grass cutting at the parks and things like that. I know you've talked before from Chris Carter's group all the way through the city staff, the agility right now, I'm sure has been huge. Well, we've had remarkable cooperation. The, the gentleman's been coming in to clean this office uh, every day uh, to make sure that it's, it's, everything's been uh, wiped down is a parks employee. And, and that's the type of cooperation we've had from the unions and the employees. And you may notice, see, despite not having all the students uh, and the, uh, the seasonal workers, uh, that we are moving forward and we are trying to do the basics and, and minimum service. You also, Terry, uh, we'll, we'll see uh, a report going to council on uh, June the 1st, uh, suggesting that we start to go back into a paid system for transit. It may not be the full fare, uh, but it uh, certainly needs to get reestablished so we can get moving forward. But it's important that we continue to do things to keep the city moving. At the same time, we're trying to deal with what are some very serious economic and social issues out there. So uh, I know today was the day that uh, marriage licenses were available again at City Hall by appointment only. So maybe there's a business opportunity here, a drive through wedding chapel at City Hall. You could maybe, you could do the Elvis look maybe, or you could do the Springsteen look, you know. I think there could be an opportunity here. I'll run it by the marriage people. And I have to say, there's a, quite a debate about this, um, is that uh, uh, you have to have an appointment and we're gonna keep all the rules in place because we can't afford at this point to reopen City Hall uh, and have the type of traffic we had in the past without having a lot of changes made to the building and how the staff function. Now, there may be an opportunity there. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, in some cases, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, some cases, people not being able to get married may be a good thing, especially if they gotta spend time together confined it may be a good shakedown cruise. It's going to work. Either that or this was definitely quite the test run. It was. Well, we will say thank you. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, thanks, Terry. <laughs> There's Mayor Mike Bradley joining us here. You're watching Sarnia Lipton Daily on your TV. Welcome back to Sarnia Lampton Daily. Well, we know this pandemic has hit the business community across Canada, across Ontario, and of course here in Sarnia Lampton and uh, Economic Development Officer for Sarnia Lampton Economic Partnership, Shauna Carr joins me now. And uh, Shauna, let's first of all, just sort of look at an overview level. How would you describe what SLEP is and uh, what the Sarnia Lampton Economic Partnership does? Well, the partnership works with all 11 municipalities in Lampton County to look at economic development. So what that essentially means is we look at supporting new business that wants to come to any of the municipalities in Lambton County or supporting our businesses that are already here. So uh, what are you seeing? What are you hearing right now in terms of the uh, local business community as uh, over this past two months have dealt with COVID-19? It's definitely a new experience for every one of us, for sure. But our business community is really pulling together. It's been awesome to see a lot of our local businesses are connecting with each other, are supporting each other, are cross-promoting with each other, which is really great. We would have loved to have seen that before now, uh, but it's great that in this most difficult time that's happening. Our consumers are also doing the same. Folks who potentially would have um, gone online and shopped in other different ways are now looking for sources for the products they want, closer to home, services they want, closer to home. How can they make sure that our businesses are gonna survive and hopefully thrive uh, into, the, into the future? 
And I guess that's the case with a uh, big U.S. border closed as well that has forced people to uh, look internally. It certainly has, which is not necessarily a bad thing. We do need those supply chains to continue to be sustainable and to be stable. That is a key part of Canada's economy, Ontario's economy, and certainly Lambton County's economy as well. So uh, we see that more often, obviously, because we are uh, the second busiest commercial crossing in the province. Uh, so that's a norm for us. And to, if you watch the 402, it looks very odd that there is not the... Uh, the sheer volume of commercial traffic that we're used to, uh, but it is still moving. It does still need to move in order to keep both of uh, the U.S. and Mexico and Canada's economies running smoothly. So have you found as well there are some businesses who maybe I'll say we're a little more progressive, whether it's maybe they had a, a pretty good website for online shopping already and maybe had looked to some things. They're the ones that are really doing pretty well right now. The folks who already were online are surviving uh, well, as much as anybody is doing well. So, of course, you have the large conglomerates like Canadian Tire, Lowe's, Home Depot, we know all those. They were able to pivot very quickly. Our smaller folks who maybe weren't used to that are now finding, A, they have the time to look at online platforms where they didn't initially, or B, it's just an absolute necessity if they want to... Uh, to manage and weather through the pandemic. The nice thing is uh, the economic partnership has a program called e-commerce. So if this is brand new to you, you can get in touch with our office and we have folks that can help you negotiate through that. We're seeing a lot of our local companies who never were online moving to that forum. They're using Facebook, they're using their website, um, shopping carts, all of those types of things as well. And that's supported by the Economic and Business Task Force that uh, I sit on as well. And I guess I know we talked to Susan Chamberlain, for example, from the bookkeeper who uh, a couple weeks ago said, you know, they were online, but certainly expanded it. And that allowed them to do delivery and do things like that. I guess the thing, too, is there's the people out there that were always probably leery a little bit of online platforms. But things have come so far, I'm sure, over the years where, uh, you know, security and privacy and things like that are certainly uh, a lot different than maybe doing something online 15 years ago. I would say it's leaps and bounds where it used to be. But we also have our, our IT companies, our internet companies, they're really pivoting quickly. Uh, we have a lot of them locally who are trying to support the local folks who don't necessarily have that background. How do we work that? Uh, so that part of our uh, economy has come together as well, recognized the need, is supporting those businesses as well. So it's a positive in that respect both ways. Um, the task force is also putting out a, a map that should go online in the next 24 hours, assuming all the tech uh, issues work out well through for all of Lambton County. So it's shoplampton.com. And that can show you who's open, what the reduced hours are, who has changes due to physical distancing, um, delivery, curbside pickup. It includes community food programs. So if you're somebody who uh, has unfortunately been laid off and you need to access uh, the food bank in Sarnia, in Petrolia, and Warwick, in the different areas, all that information is being uploaded into that system as well. Now you mentioned, we know of course, Sarnia Lipton Economic Partnership are you with, you mentioned the task force, and this task force was formed very quickly when this started. Who's sort of come together when it comes to the task force? So the task force is made up of organizations locally that res represent all of Lambton County in order to support business and our outside facing. So the economic partnership is one, uh, the Sarnia Lambton Workforce Development Board, the Sarnia Lambton Business Development Corporation, the Sarnia Lambton Chamber of Commerce, the Grand Bend and Area Chamber of Commerce, and Tourism Sarnia Lambton. Those are all uh, members of the task force. So we meet twice a week. Uh, we started meeting, I think, March 25th. So we put this together very quickly. We're a small group in order to pivot quickly to make sure that we can address the concerns that employers are having but we also have folks come on our calls uh, so we can have timely up-to-date quick information so if it's uh, the BIA from Forest for example or Petrolia or representatives from the city of Sarnia or um, the agriculture sector all of those folks can connect with us on those calls so we can hear those information and the big key thing for us is to be able to roll that information up to the province and the federal government. 
And what that has enabled us to do is when the government came out with all these great programs, uh, they did it quickly, which is great. And they were somewhat restrictive because they had to be in order to get them out fast. And so they caught a number of people in those nets with those programs, but of course you miss some because you're doing it so quickly. So the next round, they took a lot of the information that the task force that we have and a number of the ones across the province have gathered from your local people, rolled that up and new programs were announced to catch more people in a net to support more people through the pandemic. And then again, we are still doing that. So I talked to the Minister of Finance federally, his office, generally every other week, um, the Minister of Economic Development office as well. We speak to uh, members of their staff on a regular basis to make sure the concerns of Sarnia Lampton businesses are being heard at those top decision-making levels. Provincial, federal programs have certainly been out there. And have you been hearing for people here it's just being able to know about the programs and know what it means? For example, there was the one with the $40,000 worth of loans. And if you paid them back within a certain amount of time, some of it was forgiven and loans to make up for or funding really just to make up for uh, to keep people employed and you know support the payroll. Have you found where that's really been helpful to people locally once they understood the program and how to apply for it? I have found that a lot of them are receiving good feedback. They are responding from the government quite quickly on those. So, you know, we don't necessarily want our businesses to have to take on another loan. A lot of them already have a number of those, but the way these ones are structured from the federal government are very supportive of what needs to happen currently. Uh, so we're very grateful that those are happening and we are finding a number of our employers are engaging with those, uh, with those programs. There is another one that the Business Development Corporation is uh, the administrator for us, the Recovery and Relief Fund, it's called. Um, that's essentially for businesses who didn't qualify for any of the other programs. So you didn't qualify for the wage subsidy, you didn't qualify for the CERA, any of those. Um, the Business Development Corporation with Don Anderson's crew can, uh, can potentially work through that uh, application process with you and hopefully support you in that. Before we let you go, Shauna, I know it's still early in some ways, but is there any talk, what you're hearing in terms of as Sarnia Lampton and the business community comes out of this and as things reopen and we move forward, sort of the state of it? I know some people are concerned of sort of the economic impact, you know, a couple months from now, six months from now, even in the next year. Uh, is there any talk of what you're hearing in terms of how this may impact Sarnia Lampton? I would love to have a crystal ball to answer that question uh, definitively, which unfortunately I don't. Uh, we are finding, again, because our community is coming together to support our businesses, and there are a lot of support programs through the higher levels of government, that a good number of our, uh, our businesses, our community organizations, they will weather this. I think it will be a little longer term to get back to where they were. Um, and unfortunately, we probably will see some closures, which is, uh, just going to be the nature of any community and that's heartbreaking we don't want to see that uh, a lot of our businesses have put their life blood into this so we certainly don't want to see them close so any business that is finding that uh, that that could be on the horizon they need to get in touch with one of the local agencies on the task force so that we can um, hopefully prop you up help support you that sort of thing what we're going to look like in six months, I really don't know. A year from now, I would love to say that we'll be back to where we were uh, sort of October, November of 2019. Really don't know if that's the case, but uh, the government seems to think we'll be on track for that. And they have a lot of the smart people crunching the numbers. So I hope that's the case. Well, hopefully, indeed, that's where things go from there. Shauna, we appreciate the time. All the best to you. Thanks so much, appreciate it. There's Sean Akar joining us now, Economic Development Officer for the Sarnia Lampton Economic Partnership. Stay tuned, you're watching Sarnia Lampton Daily on your TV. Recapping our top story tonight, Lampton Public Health says that while the Premier wants more people to get tested, you still need a referral before going to a testing center. This avoids people lining up to get tested and having healthy people interact with those who may already be sick. That's our show tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you back here tomorrow.